My name is Ralph White. I'm an alcoholic. And we got a long way to go and a short time to get there, so I got to dispense with a lot of the preliminaries, although I want to thank Dick again for having me come out. I want to, uh, Keith, thank you and your wife for picking me up at the airport, and uh, that always impresses me, you know, and, and it doesn't mean anything to most people out there. It means some of these people sitting up here. Um, that people will go out of their way in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, uh, you know, to get me to go to the airport to pick my mama up is hard, you know, let alone. <laughs> so these guys, they don't even know me, and they show up at the airport, and they, you know, looking around, who is it? Keith knew who I was this time, so it was kind of a lot easier than it normally is. But I'm always appreciative of the hospitality that you guys show, and um, I'm still grateful. Steps one, two, and three in our program of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, you know, I've got those three steps this morning, and, um, and step one is the problem. I kind of like talking about it, I, I, you know, and I want to thank Dick because, you know, uh, but then again, I don't know what steps I don't like talking about, but uh, I like talking about one, two, and three, you know. And step one is the problem. Do we have any new people here today, new friends? Yeah. Oh, my God, we do have a couple. <laughs> you go to a gathering like this, and it's a lot of people who are thirsty for the program of recovery and who've been doing this deal for a minute. And when you do the early steps, sometimes you think, oh, I'm going to gloss over some of that because, you know, these guys, all oh, they, you know, step one, step two, oh, come on now, you know. But I am, um, I'm one um, that's been sponsored in Alcoholics Anonymous, that still sponsors in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm one that still believes that and you can't go wrong when you speak the language of the heart. And I like talking to new people. You know, I had a friend one time tell me, Ralph, wouldn't it be good to just go to a meeting where everybody is just doing, is already in step 10, 11, 12, all the, and, I'm, and I'm like, that seems to me kind of like going to a hospital with nobody but doctors. Why would you be a, <laughs> you know. They said, wouldn't you like to keep the riffraff out? I'm like, we are the riffraff. What are you talking about? <laughs> the riffraff out. But especially our new friends. You know, I got interested in the Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous when I first came. I came to you guys October the 11th, 1986, more dead than alive. Um, Sonia, and I really want to thank Sonia for the song and all her songs this weekend, especially that one. And uh, just a quick plug, I had already heard it several times because it's on a bomb CD. And um, Sonia gets inspired at these kind of deals, and I'm, you know, I'm just happy to have been a little piece of inspiration um, from my own experience. And so I came in, and, and as you might know from that song, I have a lot of brothers. I grew up, I have six, it's five brothers, there's six of us in my family, and I'm a, I'm a high achiever, and I'm a schoolboy, and I'm, you know, a uh, teacher's pet guy, straight-A student. I, you know, so I was a high achiever, and I didn't start doing anything until late in life. I took my first drink at 16 years old. It did some things for me that, it, that nothing else had done before. Because I was, a, in addition to being the schoolboy, I was a shy guy. I was scared of girls. You know, I was uh, introverted. Uh, I was popular, but at the same time, I, I always had to deal work. And if you know me, you won't like me. So alcohol freed me from those bonds, and it allowed me to start doing and being uh, a guy that I that had always been inside that I I always knew about you guys didn't and he was able to come out and play and and so for years alcohol did what it is that it does for guys like me it seemed to work I went off to college and and just like uh, in Bill's story when he talked about the drive for success was on I proved to the world I was important that was me I went off to this major university and my drinking and using really took off. And uh, 
You know, that's, that's where, you know, that tune got inspired because, you know, Bill in his story talked about out of this alloy of drink and speculation, I would later forge a weapon that would turn on me like a boomerang and all but cut me to ribbons, right? And I always say, I don't talk like that. My mom used to say, trouble always start out like fun. And when I started drinking, that's, that's what happened, you know. I could, you couldn't have told me where this deal was going to take me. You know, because I started drinking and I started having fun and I started with, you know, the thing youngsters drink when I was in college, Red Mountain Wine, you know, Annie Green Springs, Boone's Farm, Spinata, you know, uh, and then moved up rum and coke, screwdrivers, gin gimlets, you know, Southern Comfort. And I'm, I'm in the life, man. And then I start using us, I start smoking herb, I start using us drugs, and I'm in it. It's the early 70s, you know, late 60s, and it's that time. You know, it's that time. You go to concerts, you don't know your neighbors and the rest of that. And I can't tell you when it started doing more to me than it was doing for me. I can't tell you that. I can tell you that I already suspected some things that I learned about later on in the doctor's opinion, but I had them wrong. I suspected that I had, a, you know, that there was something bodily different about me than other folk from the way that I was doing it, right? I would be at a party till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. That was never go-home time for me. You know, the, yeah, the bar might close, but I know where every after hours is, and I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere else, and you guys go home. And I thought the reason I stayed out so much was I had high capacity. Yeah, I'm bodily different. I'm bodily different. You guys are poop butts. I got high capacity, you know, and that's why I drink and consume so much, me and my boys and my crew, because we, we're the real ones. You know, we're trolls. Well, I don't want to use that word. I was about to say we're trolls, you know, but I'm a brewing, so that, that no. Um, but we, we, you know, that's what we do. And, um, and so I'm, I'm drinking and I'm using, and then I start having some problems. I start getting in trouble with this thing. I got fired from my first job about 1978 or 1979. I didn't connect it to drinking. I connected it to Thursday paydays. <laughs> Why would you pay anybody on Thursday and expect them <laughs> and expect them to show up to work on Friday? That didn't make no sense to me. That that is that's ridiculous, you know. I was in about my third inventory before the truth about that came out. I was really, I was really mad about that job, you know. That's, that's why I got fired Thursday paydays, you know. And so I got asked to leave my first spot, and then things start kept on happening. And, and I'm like the big book describes, you know, I'm a real Dr. Jekyll and Miss Hyde. It says in the book, the alcoholic more than most folk leads a double life, and I'm the double life guy. I don't always share about it, but I was rising in my career as I was also rising, as my alcoholism was rising. You know, so now, you know, it's about 1982, and I get my first job in management. I'm working in management in the law department of a major utility company out in uh, Los Angeles, you know, and so the double life guy is this. I'm the business guy, you know, corporate guy by day, but I'm the vampire by night. And the vampire outgrows the business guy, always. The vampire always outgrows the housewife. The vampire always outgrows the PTA. It just always does. And so I'm business guy by day and I'm vampire by night. And then the vampire starts showing up at work, you know. <laughs> And the vampire don't work at work, you know. <laughs> and they don't pay the vampire to come to work, you know. And it's a cold thing, you know. I had this office that had this big glass window that allowed me ostensibly to look out on the workforce. Well, it allowed the workforce to look in on me, right? And when you be on one of them six-day runs and do that whiplash thing and look to see if anybody lo and everybody's looking, that ain't cool, you know. And pretty soon... Pretty soon they call a the vampire in and say, you got to go and take dude with you, you know. So I've lost this management job, and, and now the losses are starting to mount, and they're starting to mount, and they're starting to mount, and they're starting to mount. And I can't see the truth about my condition. I can't see that when I go to happy hour, because I will go to happy hour with the people, you know, working with them, you know, good employee relations. I'm the supervisor, but I mingle with, you know, the workforce and the rest. You know, I couldn't see that when I said, and you know, I'm just going to stay for happy hour. You know, and they come around, last call, happy hour. My hand involuntarily goes, bring me nine gin gimlets, you know, and I'm, I'm there. 
I'm there till two or three. And I didn't see why that was, why that continued to happen to me every single time. I don't know why it was that every single payday I'd start off. I'm just going to go over here to my boy's house. I'm going to go to Dave's house. We're just going to kick it for me. I'd start off like that, and I'd end up whole paycheck, whole paycheck. I never knew, and I had a suspicion that it's better off for you not to take one at all than to get started. I had a vague suspicion of that, but I didn't know it. You know, people used to come up to me, man, you knew, no, you got a drink. Yeah, I got a drinking problem. My problem is not getting enough to drink. You need to get you some business, you know. And I'm, that's the kind of guy I am. So, so I made it in here October 11th, 1986, at the end of a long, bad run. You know, I had no longer been working. I got fired in 1985, and from 1985 to 1986, my job consisted of getting it, doing it, coming down from it, getting it, doing it, coming down from it, getting it, doing it, coming down. That was it. That was my profession. I was scuffling. I was already familiar with some of the slogans you guys use. I already knew about living one day at a time. That's how I was doing it anyway. I was already familiar with going to rooms like this with people like you. But the rooms I was in didn't have electricity. The rooms I was in, they didn't say, keep coming back. <laughs> you know, rooms. So I was already familiar with some of that. And I had descended into a real dark place that October in 1986. And guys like me don't get second chances. I had lost that management job and I was through. You know, I was married at the time and I had been separated from my family. I didn't know where they were living. I didn't know where my little girl was enrolled in school. I didn't know, you know, it had been a long time since I had answered anybody's 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock wake up call to go to work. And, you know, I no longer thought I was employable. And I got to that place, that jumping off place. And I got to the point where I had conceded to myself, it's like this and it's just going to be like that. You know, I love that part in the book when it talks about how dark it is before the dawn. Because you don't know when, when dawn is coming. You don't know. Something about grace. When desperation meets opportunity, a little window opens up. Better jump through the window and on October 11th, 1986, desperation met opportunity. My brother was in a treatment center already and a guy was chasing me in a black truck. And I just was tired that October 1986. And I told my mom a lie. I said, if you let me up in your house and stand here this weekend, I will not leave. And Ryan's in a recovery program and he's got a bed for me. He didn't have a bed for me. But I needed to get up in my mom's house because I just wanted to rest that Saturday morning. And to seal the deal, I called my brother in that treatment program. I said, man, tell mom you got a bed waiting on me. And you know how when you're new to recovery and you can't wait for one of your loved ones to join you. And Ron was on the other end of the line saying, hell yeah, man, I got a bed. You want to come down here? We got this a bed for you. And the miracle of it was I stayed in my mom's house that weekend. And when Monday morning came, I went down to the Harbor Light Center on Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles. And on October the 11th, on October the 13th of 1986, Grace came calling. And I went in that uh, treatment center and they took me to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I embarked, started embarking on this journey. And I was able to connect some dots. I was able to put some flesh on my experience. Step one is the problem and step one is a conclusion I draw based on my experience. I don't come up in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and mull over my condition and say, oh, I decide that I'm powerless over alcohol. No, alcohol decided that for me. Thank you very much. It took me coming in these rooms for me to connect the dots because I always, I'm twisted, you know. So I read the doctor's opinion. And one of the reasons why I like the big book Alcoholics Anonymous so much and one of the reasons why we have this workshop set up this weekend and these things have come into play anyway is there are people who've discovered what I discovered, what takes place in this big book Alcoholics Anonymous. You'll hear a lot of people say, that this is the, that the solution is in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, I want to let you know something. 
you know, the directions for the solution is in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. But God is not contained inside of 164 pages. You know, in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, this is the basic text for recovery, and it's our instruction manual. But the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is dynamic. It's alive. It walks and it talks and it shakes hands. It's got a beating heart. It's got arms to hug, and it's got shoulders to cry on. It's got ears to listen. The program Alcoholics Anonymous. So when you hear the presenters come up this weekend, we're not going to be taking you on a textbook tour and grade you on how well you know the information. This is not an intellectual exercise. You know, I have a sponsor, and he always talks about you can't treat a spiritual condition with intellectual means. So by no means am I up here to talk about this. The reason and I talk about this book, you'll never hear me talk about. It's in the book, so it's true. People wrote the book. Matter of fact, people just like us, flawed people, drunks, people with a whole bunch of problems. They, had, they were newly sober at the time. When the book was being written, the oldest one in the group was coming up on three years. When the book was published, the oldest member of the group hadn't even had five years yet. But you will hear me say, it's in the book because it's true. The book is a compilation of some spiritual experiences and some people in a looking back way said, this is what we did to get to where we got. And if you want to get to where we got, this is what it is you do. What the book does for me, every step of the way, it does several things. Number one, for each one of these steps, and as you hear the presenters come up this weekend, they'll share it with you. For each one of these steps, it tells me why I need to take this step, why I need to do it. What is it about me? Step one, admit it that I'm powerless over alcohol and that my life has become unmanageable. Why do I need to do that? Well, as long as I keep on fighting, I'm going to keep on losing, you know. And it's, it's, it's that, that whole, the paradoxes in Alcoholics Anonymous took me a long time to wrap my head around. This whole surrender to win concept. I played ball. You know, any guys out here to play ball, you don't quit. You know, you, you, no, you don't never quit. You don't give up. In my neighborhood, you don't give up. You don't show weakness. You don't show no signs of weakness. Hell no. That's weak quitting. Surrender, that ain't in my vocabulary. It's in, it, it's in me, but I don't want you to see it's in me. You know, I, I, yeah, I get scared, but you don't show scared. You know, and so I, I associated surrender and quit with scared, with weak. When you know something is bigger than you and defeated you. So, so I, it took me a long time to wrap my head around some of these concepts. So this idea of surrender, the whole con the, the notion that underlies that first step, you know, it's not one that I, that I sat up here and wrapped my head around. It's not one that I welcome. It's one that I walked into as a result of my condition. You know, I, I love when it talks about crushed by a self-imposed crisis we can neither avoid or evade. And that's one of the second, but that's where I got. Bill Wilson, in his story, he talks about quicksand was all around me, stress out all around me. No friendly, and I mean, there was no friendly shore in any direction for me. And you know the cold thing about quicksand? The more you fight, the more you sink. The more you fight, the quicker you sink. And I was going down slow. And that October in 86, man, I got to the point where I was beaten to a state of reasonableness. I had tried Alcoholics Anonymous three times before, and each time I had come to the program, I had come, and I was serious about staying sober, dead serious about staying sober. Hard for a guy like me, though, because I'm handicapped by some stuff. One is I couldn't ever find myself in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a thin line between identifying and comparing, and I would always compare and I would never identify. And so I would read the big book Alcoholics Anonymous and I couldn't find myself in any of the stories. You know, and somebody had to teach me about how to, you know, how to read the big book Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and how to come up in here and identify with your story so I could find mine. So what I would do at a meeting, you know, I would listen to a speaker, somewhat like me, I'd pick out what in my ears was the most profound thing that that speaker shared about, make sure tomorrow night when I go to a meeting the speaker's not there and not too many of you guys, <laughs> repeat what he said, tack on a keep going, coming back, 
And I thought if it was true in my experience, you know, if I thought if I claimed it from the podium, it would be true in my experience. And I kept getting loaded, kept getting loaded, kept getting loaded, kept getting loaded, kept getting loaded. And I learned something. Because the first step talks about admitted that I'm powerless over alcohol and my life had become unmanageable. And the first time I came and you guys clapped when I was new and you welcomed me with open arms and it had been a long time since I had been welcomed with any arms, open or otherwise, you know, and you guys welcomed me and you hugged me and you took me in. And you said, are you admitting that you're alcoholic? I didn't really believe I was. I didn't know what, what an alcoholic was. But I admitted that I was because it was the admission to talk. It was the admission fee that you had to pay in order to share at a meeting. And so I said, I'm an alcoholic because I like talking at meetings. And I like the attention that it brought. And, I, and beyond that. Because I was scared. It wasn't that I liked talking at first. But the other thing is I'm a fitter in her. And everybody else said they were an alcoholic. And why would I stand out by not? So I also said I'm alcoholic because it's the thing to do. And if you're going to be in this club, and I like to be popular at any club that I'm in, then, yeah, I'm an alcoholic too, you know, because everybody was saying it. And that's and, and so who was it that said that Clancy last night said, you know, the worst insult you can give an alcoholic is anonymous. He ain't even an alcoholic, no way, you know, so... <laughs> I learned that quick. So, yeah, I'm an alcoholic, but I kept getting loaded, kept getting loaded, kept getting loaded. Because I admitted it out of my mouth, but I hadn't taken what I like to call step A. The free, you know, step A precedes step one. I had not fully conceded to my innermost self that I was an alcoholic. This is the first step. Somewhere where you live. Somewhere when you're laying on your mama's living room floor at 33 years old in the middle of the night when the money's all gone and you can't get no more and, you th- and your conscience comes visiting late at night and you get that visit from the enemy, I call it your con- and you land on your mama's li- and you think to yourself, what happened to you? You used to get up to go to work in the morning. What happened to you? You used to want to go to your daughter's school. What happened to you? You used to want to be somebody. What happened to you? And somewhere along the line, and I can't tell you when, it came on me like a ton of bricks. It's like this, and it's just going to be like this. I did not know that's how conceited to my innermost self looked. And surrender... It's customized and it's personalized and it looks different on every person. It's hard to see it from the outside. And it's a looking back experience for each and every one of us. That's how we know. Somebody said, how you know you surrender? And for each and every one of us sitting in here, it's a looking back process of shit. I didn't know that was the date, but looking back, I see that's what happened, because I thought I had been surrendered before, and alcohol surrendered me. You know, and I came in here in that condition, beat up, out of ideas. You know, two conditions for me to get this program in that first step. Number one, I had to want it. Number two, I had to be hopeless. I had to run out all, all hope and game and coming up and coming back and plan B and all that. And I came in here in that condition, man, that October in 1986. Found out that there's something bodily different about me. And the way that I found that out was not through your experience, but by looking at my own experience. Looking at all the times I said, I'm just going to spend $20, what happened? Whole paycheck. Looking at all the times I said, I'm going to stop off at Bob's house for a minute, what happened? Whole paycheck. Looking at the times I said, I'm just going to go over here to happy hour for a minute, what happened? Whole paycheck. I don't have to look at your experience, your experience, your. That's what happens in the rooms, Alcoholics Anonymous. You guys start sharing stories about you when I start looking at my own experience because this is a self-diagnosed deal. And I looked at my own experience and I learned every two weeks from 1979, 1985, when I took one anything, no matter where I had to go, what I had to do, who I had to see, no matter how great the wish or the necessity, my body would take over. 
and I'd have to have another. If we talk about step one and we don't talk about the bodily component, we're missing the whole deal. Dr. Silkworth says any description of the alcoholic that does not talk about that, you know, the bodily feature, you know, is incomplete. So we spend a whole lot of time, you know, and, and for anybody who's new to this process and anybody who's interested in this process, the whole description of what happens to me that makes me bodily different, it starts taking place in the doctor's opinion. It continues on through Bill's story. You know, it works its way up through there is a solution. Somewhere midway through, you know, um, more about alcoholism. I like the way that they title the chapters. You know, first we start, there's the doctor's opinion. And the doctor's opinion is a diagnosis. That's what we normally get when we go to the doctor. And when we go to the doctor, we go to doctors for, you know, we go to shrinks for mental stuff. But when we go to an MD, a doctor, it's something that's wrong with my body. Something that's wrong with my body. First clue that there's something bodily different about me. At the front end of our book, we have the doctor's opinion. His diagnosis of what ails Ralph, right? And so I go up in the doctor's opinion and I find out these things. I find out a lot of interesting facts that nobody but people like me suffer from this thing we call the phenomena of craving. We call it phenomena because we don't know why it is and we can't describe, we can't put a face on it, but we know it takes place. And this thing called, so it only happens in me. So if I've ever been one that said I'm just going to take one and ended up at the closing out the bar, I'm in that number. You know, I'm in that number. If I'm one of the ones that said I'm just going to spend 20 and ended up spending the whole paycheck, probably in that number. If I'm one, you know, so I, I, I look at that and I like the way that the book is written. So you, we got the doctor's opinion. Then we say, okay, we're going to tell what it is that we do, the basis of Alcoholics Anonymous. We're going to do one alcoholic sharing with another. That's the basis. One drunk sharing with another. The rest is the fluff. You know, the, you know, we have a taper, we have all, but the basis is one drunk sharing with another. And we start that with Bill's story. Beginning of our book, we're going to have one drunk sharing with another, and he's going to share his experience, strength, and hope. He's going to share what he used to be like, what happened, and what he's like today. And I'm going to see the progression of the disease of alcoholism with a face on it. And if I track Bill's story and match mine next to it, I see the progression in my life. So then we do that, and then, okay, dude, you came in here, you tore up, you messed up, you wore out. Now we're going to give you a little hope. There is a solution. Because when you read Bill's story, Bill is a cold out, ooh, you know, you, there, there is a solution, Ralph. There is a solution. You know, yeah, you tore up and the rest of that. Whew, there is a solution. Okay, dude, before you get carried away, let's talk some more about alcoholism. Let's really get you grounded again before you get, because the goose hung high, just like Bill said. We're going to talk some more about alcoholism. And then we talk some more about alcoholism. And midway through that chapter where we're discussing the bodily difference, it turns on me. And it says all of this, this talk about taking the first one, it would be pointless and academic if you just don't take the first one. Just say no. That's a hell of a program of recovery if it worked, huh? Just say no. I can't just say no. Matter of fact, why would you? I never wanted to say no. So what the hell is that about? No. You know. And so it turns on a dime. It says academic important. It says because the real problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind. Rather, why, why you say that? Why is it center in my mind? Because guess what? I already talked about spending the whole paycheck, but every two weeks, stone sober. Not under the out, not not because of phenomena of craving, which happens after I take the first one. Stone sober after getting wore out the previous two weeks. After getting everything taken, the pre after coming home remorseful again, after coming home without a check again, after not being able to buy Christmas presents again, after saying I'm not going to do this again, something happens on Wednesday prior to the Thursday payday. Something happens. And stone sober my car seems to drive to the LIQ on payday. 
second part of this disease, of that first, you know, of, of, of that, of the disease that I suffer from. The bodily difference, but there's something mentally different. We call that a mental obsession. The obsession that somehow, someday, I'll be able to control and enjoy this magic potion I discovered all those many years ago. So I'm in this obsession. So I can't drink because of my body, but I can't not because my mind won't accept that fact. And I did that over and over and over. So if my disease centers in my thinking, guess what? That ain't where recovery centers. Don't try to treat this disease with this disease. I can't think myself out of this deal. That's the coldest part for me. Because I'm a smart guy and I'm a thinking guy and I'm a figure out it. We got any other analysts in here? I'm a figure it out. <laughs> Somebody in here came here this weekend to get more information. <laughs> this deal ain't always about the acquisition of knowledge and information. How about the acquisition of knowledge and information? We're going to share a lot of information from this book this weekend. We're going to share that. And the biggest piece of the information I can share with you is I don't treat this disease with this disease. I don't treat my thinking with my thinking. The disease centers in my thinking, recovery centers in my feet. I train my feet. I train my feet. So this whole mental, you know, so, so that deal. So, Ralph, what are you talking about? So we go deeper into that chapter right there, and it talks a lot about the mental states that precede or relapse in the drinking, the insanity that's discussed. You know, when it talks about with you, the minute that I'm powerless over alcohol and my life had become unmanageable. And so we do a lot of talking about the first piece and that unmanageability. That cold part, the thing about the unmanageability for me early on was easy to see. I didn't have a driver's license. I didn't have a place to stay. Hadn't had a paycheck in I don't know how long. I was sleeping in the back of my mother's garage, and I was eating lemons off a neighbor's lemon tree for breakfast. I come from a major university in this country. That's where it took me at the end. So that basic unmanageability, not able to just provide the basic necessities of life on a basic level, that one was not hard for me to wrap my head around. The cool thing about this program for me is the desperation that's associated with the first step. Um, the way old timers in my home group said it, the worse off you are when you get here, the better off your chances of staying. And so I'm grateful now. I wasn't grateful then. I'm grateful now that I went down as low as I went down. I'm grateful because I came in here Really, 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 really desperate. Didn't come up in here out of virtue. Didn't come up in here because I'm a good guy. Didn't come up in here looking for God or looking for the way. Came in here just hoping to learn how not to spend a whole paycheck every two weeks. Hoping to get my ex-old lady back. And just hoping to get a good night's sleep in somebody's bed, in a real bed. Now, I'm not a guy that ever slept in the street. But I went to a real dark place for me. So that step one experience of surrender. Alcohol surrendered me. I had come in here four times. I don't know another way to put it. Some people will say it's one thing in the first step I have to bring to the table. Nobody else can bring it. My sponsor can't bring it for me. You know, if it's some new people in here or some people relatively new or some people in here in their experience, you know, my background is in the law, so I call it forum shopping. You know, going out and you look for the right person who's going to say what it is you already want to hear. Some people do that. Some people think if I just get the right sponsor, that'll do it. 
I need Bob Darrell. That'll do it. I need Polly Pistol. That'll do it. You know, I, that, that's the deal. But it's one thing I got to bring to the table. Care who's up in here. I don't care the sponsor. Bill Wilson could be sitting up in here. He can sit up under his wing. You know, I don't hear. It's one thing in that for, I got to bring to the table. Can't nobody else bring it. That's desire. That's willingness. I got to bring the willingness. Can't nobody put it in me. Can't nobody give it to me. Can't nobody else have it for me. Trust me, if the other folk could have it, my mama was willing for me to be sober way before I was sober. My wife was willing for me to be sober way before I was sober. My boss was willing for me to be sober way be- If it was other folks' willingness, all of us would have been here a long time ago. You know, <laughs> I had to bring it. Damn, Ralph, how do I get willingness? How do I get that up in me? I've been struggling with this deal for the longest in any area of my life. How do I get it? I don't know what one way to get it. I don't know but one way to get it. Well whooped ass. <laughs> I'd like to put it in a kinder, gentler way, but <laughs> that's it. And thank God in 1986 I was tenderized long enough, well enough to get in here <laughs> and hear the music of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, and so I came in and on that first step, I hear a lot of people say, you know, uh, I'm still in the first step. I'm still in the first. I'm. The first step is the problem. And it's a conclusion I draw based on my experience. Second step, solution. Came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. And that second step, like the first step, is also a conclusion I draw based on my experience. Came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. My second step is in uh, my favorite chapter in the book, We Agnostics. We Agnostics, at the first paragraph, has got a two-question test for alcoholism. You know, in the literature, you know, and if you go to central office, they'll have pamphlets, and they might have a 20-question test for alcoholism. They might have a 40-question test for alcoholism. You know, you have these long tests for alcoholism. In the chapter, We Agnostic, there's a two-question test for alcoholism. If when you start drinking, not able to control the amount I take, that's me, or if when I want to quit, I find I cannot quit entirely on my own, that's me, then you're probably alcoholic. Oh, okay, that's me. When I start, I can't tell you when I'm going to stop. When I tell you I don't want to do it again, I do it again. Oh, yeah, that's, that's me. Then you're probably alcoholic. If that be the case then you are suffering from an illness, only a spiritual experience to conquer. Whole deal. Second, whole thing. I'm suffering from an illness, that's me, only a spiritual experience, not an intellectual experience. Tried that. Not a financial experience. Tried that. Not a romantic experience. Tried that. You know, not, not a physical experience, working out, to eating right. I tried that. You know, not, you, you, that's what we call this last house on the block, because most of us have probably tried every other experience. Do I ha- Oh, man, you know, to be doomed to die an alcoholic death over here or to live life, not easy. How come they ain't easy? Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not stupid. Now, come on, come on, come on. Be doomed to die not only a death, but an alcoholic death. Slow death. You know, walking three or four o'clock in the morning death. Your kids are looking at you with disgust death. People, you know, you, you doing time on the weekend. That, that, that kind of slow, slow death. Just won't lay down death. You know, torturous death. To be doomed to die an alcoholic death. Okay, got it. Or to live life are not always easy. All to, how come they ain't easy? Because they slip that other piece in there, that live life. Or to live life on a spiritual basis. Are not always easy. First time I read that, I identified. Wow. To be doomed to die an alcoholic death 
or to live life on a spiritual basis are not always easy alternatives to face. Why ain't they easy? When are alternatives not easy to face? When they don't look different. Ralph, you want the electric chair or the gas chamber? Wow. <laughs> really? <laughs> when the alternatives seem equally unappealing, Anybody remember as a kid, they offer you castor oil or cod liver oil. <laughs> wow, some even in you know. When they seem equally unappealing or they look exactly the same, they're not easy alternatives. And for a guy like me, living life on a spiritual basis, damn near seem like death. Why? Because I don't know what a spiritual basis is and I think I know what, then I think I do. I think I do. I'm handicapped by prejudice, and I'm handicapped by what I think I know about it. Spiritual life means no fun, no cussing, no sex, no looking and no move, no none of the stuff that I like. That's what spiritual life means. <laughs> spiritual life means straight and yes, sir, and goose stepping along the road of happy destiny and alcoholics. And no, hell no, hell no. If you think that's what's right, no. But I think I know what it looks like. I think I know what spiritual. So this whole deal, you know, the whole. So, so from now on, the second step is the solution. Three through t- three through nine. That's the program of action. The concept, because the, the second step, I, the second step is the solution. But I don't consummate the second step in step two. Second step is consummated at the end of nine. When you get ready to go in the ten, it'll say, so by now, for by now, sanity is returned. Comes back after doing some stuff. After doing some stuff. But that second step, you know, that, that coming to believe in a power was hard for a guy like me. And I was raised in church. I was raised in Baptist church. I was raised under doctrine and I was raised under orthodoxy. I was raised under this is what it looked like and this is what it better looked like for you. And it didn't feel like that for me. I'd sit in church. I'd hear the stories. They sound like myths. Couldn't wrap my head around. I'm not, I'm not, this is Ralph talking. This is not Ralph bashing. No trip. I'm not talking about your experience. I'm talking about my ears. I'm talking about my ears. I came up in the 60s. I was a rebellious person. I was a self-reliant guy. I was a smart guy. My grandparents were in church and my mom, was, they needed to be. They were old people from the south that had, immig- that had come out to Los Angeles, blue-collar guy, you know. By the time I was already in high school, I was more educated than my granddad already, you know. So, yeah, dude, you need to be in church. Y'all look good. Being- you need your life directed by somebody else. You ain't slick as me. You ain't sharp as me. You don't have hustle like me. You don't have game like me. You don't have intellect like me. You are not going to rise to the levels I'm going to rise to, granddaddy, you know. And, and, and that's, that's how I thought. You know, I came up in the 60s. Religion is an opiate of the people. I'd rather smoke mine. Thank you very much. You know, I say stuff like that. That's, that's the era I came up in. I'm self-reliant. I don't need nobody telling me how to think, believe, and feel. When I read Bill's story and I read about Bill talking about how, you know, him and his grandfather would resist, you know, the, 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 listening to the preacher tell him how to, I was like, that's me. That's me. I started identifying. That's me. You know, so this whole God idea, we were made to go to church. You know, we walked to church every morning, Sunday school, church, evening service, ate dinner at church. I'm blind. I'm trying to look at the time. You know, ate dinner at church, you know, BTU. And I said, when I turn 16 years old, you never have to worry about Ralph White darkening the doors of anybody else's church. Said it, did it, meant it. That's what I did. And that's how I was. So when I came in here and you guys started talking about this idea of a power that's greater than myself, you know, it was really something I resisted, you know. But I didn't resist as hard because I was tenderized, you know. And there were some things in my experience that worked for me in the second step experience. There's a negative second step that precedes the second step. Just like there's a step A that preceded step one. And the negative step coming to believe step was I had come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as I had been living it. I had come to believe that the way I was living was the way I was going to be living. That's it. That's all. Every day gray. 
Every day the same. Every day ugly. Every day no hope. It's a cold thing. You can take a lot of things from people. You can take money from them. You can take possessions from them. You know, you can take things from them. And I've lost a lot of those things, even in recovery. But it's a cold thing to be a person walking with no hope. That's a cold way to live. Knowing Tuesday's going to look like Monday. And that's not bad if, if Monday look good. But when they all look gray, when the color's gone, I got a friend at home, and it's a lady. And I identify when she said it, and I don't know why, but she says, you know, life had that look to her. And she said when she drank, she, you know, when she drank, she felt wittier, prettier, and tittier. And I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> Now, don't ask me why I could I didn't, but you know, you feel me? You, that, don't that sound descriptive? You know, and I recognized the first time I said it. But life got real drab for me. It got worse than drab. It got intolerable. Come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as I have been living it. So when you laid out the simple kit of spiritual tools, there was nothing left for me but to pick them up. So this deal, crushed by self-imposed crisis, I did this to myself. Here's the cold thing about that second step. I'd already come to believe in a power greater than me. That's what makes it so easy to take it. I'd already come to believe in a power greater than me. We call that power king alcohol. I came to believe in it. I believe that it made me prettier and I believe it made me wittier. The other one we'll leave to the ladies, you know. Um, I believe that it took away problems. I believe that it did stuff. And then it turned on me. Turned on me. But I knew it had me. I knew it had me. Just like Bill, when he talked about alcohol was my master, I knew it had me. So I had come to believe in a power greater than me already. I needed a power greater than it. Wow. I needed a power greater than it. So what would make me willing to believe that there was one? Because if there wasn't, I was in big trouble. I took step two out of desperation, and I took step two out of what do I have to lose, and I took step two out of something else. You know, when you go to court, and there's a lot of people in here are familiar with going to court, and there probably ain't that many lawyers in here either. You know, um, <laughs> you know when you go to court, what, what rules the day? Evidence. Documentary evidence, testimonial evidence. Call them witness testimony. And the reason why I like the program so much is I'm a pragmatic guy and I'm a practical guy. I'm not the virtuous guy. I'm not the guy that'll do it and you can tell me, you need to get this power because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing you need to be, you know. Church would tell me that. That's what I heard in church. That's what I heard in church. You need to come right to get right. You need to already come right to get right. If you ain't coming right, don't even bother coming up in here. Do you accept this? Is that? You already got to be accepting of some stuff. You already got to say you down with some doctrine. Yes, I am going to follow these dictates. You already got to come right to get right. And that was, you know, that was hard for me. But up in here, what ended up happening was folk would be what I like about the program, what I liked about the power, what I like about when you go to chapter four and read it. It'll talk about why it makes more sense to believe than not to believe. It makes more sense. It makes more sense to believe in this God idea. Not that it's virtuous or it's right or you'll get a reward somewhere. It makes more sense to believe than not to believe. I was talking about my granddad, right? And in the book, it'll say some things. See where spiritual people are right. See where they've been, you know, they've been exhibiting a degree of stability and usefulness and happiness that you should have been seeking for. And I could never see that. So all the times I'm slicker than my granddaddy and I'd have made more money in a year than he'd have made in his life and all the stuff I used to say to myself. And then when I was in the midst of this process, it dawned on me and maybe somebody might even ask me, Ralph, how many times did your granddaddy ask you for bail money? I'm slicker than him, I'm smarter than him, I'm self-reliant, 
I'm more educated. I make more money. Who's asking who for help all the time? Wow. Maybe it is something to this deal that they talk about. My mama has six sons. All of us were in the life. All of us in 1985, from the period of 84 to 85, all five of my brothers and and myself ended up being put out of our respective homes, and we all ended up in my mom's house. We were practicing. (laughs) Practicing the disease. Six grown men. And there were days we couldn't come up with $5 between us. My mother used to come home every single day with a bag of groceries. Because if she kept any food in the refrigerator, she these six grown leeches that she gave birth to would have cleaned it out. And my mom, in the darkest of dark, with no way of knowing that her son would be standing in front of you guys one day some years later. With no way of knowing her other son does the same thing sometime. With no way of knowing her baby boy will be 25 years sober on Christmas Day. With no way of knowing, no way of knowing, my mom, in the darkest of dark, would say, God will make a way. And I would look at her with my slick, sharp, smart self. Yeah, you need that. A spiritual experience. You know, and I suffer from an illness and I need that. You know, so I've seen that demonstrated. And I started looking at where perhaps religious people were right. Exhibiting a degree of stability. Because if she didn't have a house, where was I going to stay? Usefulness and happiness. Came in here and I started looking at that and thirsting for it. And I listened to you and 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 you you talk about there was a power that had done for you what you couldn't do for yourself. But before you said that, you would share what you were like. And I would know this is not a deacon or a minister sharing with me the power of the power. But it was somebody just like me. Testimonial evidence. And pretty soon the witness testimony got overwhelming. And it seemed real stupid for a guy like me to talk about, you can't fly when I'm looking at people soaring. Bill talked about wholesale miracle. You know, when I went to church and they'd be talking about the miracles and, and Moses parting the Red Sea and Daniel and the lions then, I'd be listening. No disrespect to any people. Who, I couldn't wrap my head around. Sound like myths to me. Sound like myths. And then I hear Dick Anderson talk about being in the, in the lion's den with the Black Panther. I said, oh, yeah, I could see that story. <laughs> I listen to Tom Iris, I listen to Polly Pistol, I listen to Mark Gallagher, I listen to people, and I say, yeah, I, that, that's, I can feel that miracle. And it started seeming like crazy for me to discount the power of the power. And I took the, do I now believe, or am I even willing to believe in the power? Yeah, I'm willing. I'm willing because I ain't got nothing to lose. I'm willing because I'm tore up. I'm willing because my life is on the line. You know, and I took it out of desperation. Got to the point, you know, and even sometime today, life feel big. Sometimes today, life feels very big. We listen to the stories Thursday night, and we listen to the stories of the family. I listen to Dave, and I listen to Polly, you know, and listen to what happens even on the road of recovery. You know how they say that God don't give you more than you can handle? That's true, but life will. That's why you need God. You know, and so sometimes when you get on the road and money gets short and bills get long, kids or relationships, they they ain't looking the same as they were looking before. Sometimes you're driving and you just feel like, what's a, you know, and I was talking to a sponsor. And I got squarely confronted with it again. That question we get to. 
either God is everything or he's nothing. What was my choice to be? First time I heard, read that, I'm like, how could I choose that anyway? If God is God, don't matter what my choice is, God is God. What do you mean, what was my choice to be? What was my choice to be? Either God is everything or he's nothing. Either he is or he isn't. What was my choice to be? Well, for those of you sitting in a dark place right now, sitting in a situation that seemed like it's beyond what it is that I have the means to, to deal. You know, we get in a season, it's Christmas, and sometimes for a lot of people it's really happy and joyous. Sometimes for some folk it's one that reminds me of, man, I don't have what I used to have. Man, I'm getting caught up in these expectations and what I think about myself. I'm 59 years old. I don't have a retirement plan. I don't have no money saved up. I'm wondering what is life going to have in store for a guy like me. I'm wondering what the hell is going to be going on. Either guy and I was talking to a sponsee and she was laying, she was laying it out and he just gets real clear to me. God, everything or nothing. God is God. God is going to keep God, and the problem is Ralph keep Ralph. What's my choice to be, dude? Because God is going to keep on doing it. ain't that God stops in grace. Grace is grace. Grace is coming. God do what it is he do. I walked up to a meeting. I was about nine months sober. I was bopping up to a meeting. Old timers see me. Ralph, what's going on? Oh, I'm just doing God's work. He said, what you think you can do for God, God can't do for himself. <laughs> Floor me. Floor me. Because I thought I gave the right answer. Because I'm the right answer guy, right? And hey, I'm, I'm the right answer guy. What, what, what was wrong with that answer? You know, I'm nine months of doing God's work. I said, but, you know, raised right in Alcoholics Anonymous, really raised right under the lash of alcoholism. So somewhere that smug superiority I normally roll with, that arrogance that I normally roll with, that, that, that intellectual arrogance, it was beat down in my first year. And I was really one that came in here and got at the feet of the old timers. I was really one that came in here and listened to you guys like only the dying. I was really one that came in here and I started going to meetings, going to meetings, going to meetings, going to meetings, going to meetings. meetings. There's something that's underrated about the feet training that's required in this deal. And part of the feet training is the repetition. And we don't talk about that as much because we talk about, we'll be talking about some lofty stuff and we'll, the presenters in here will be going into the theory, but there are some bad to basics in Alcoholics Anonymous, particularly not just when you knew, sometime when you all. I got to go back to basics and do the repetition. You know, the thing about this deal that you don't know, unintended consequences. You don't even know. Some stuff you do and they have consequences you're not anticipating later on. You know, you don't know that that's what's going to happen. You know, you're just doing the deal. You're just doing the deal. You're just doing the deal. So this, this picking up ashtrays. And this listening to people and this sitting down and shutting up and being quiet. what it is, unintended consequences. You know, there's some humility being developed in a guy like me because humility ain't hoped for, wished for, thought up. You can't, you can, it can, can't be, it's developed. When we go to meetings, it's more than just the acquisition of knowledge and information. You know, sometimes it's about the development and the cultivation of some things that I can't get no other place. So this development, this cultivation of this humility that I didn't know I had, I know I had, you know, but it was being developed unknown to me. You know, and so I'm sitting here with the old timer, and so I just asked him, John, what is it? You know, if I'm not I'm supposed to be doing God's work, he said, Ralph, check this out. This is your job. Your job is to do for God's kids. God's job is to do for you. God gave you something he didn't even reserve for himself. I said, what the hell is that? God gave me something he didn't even keep for himself. He gave you the choice over whether or not you're going to return his love. God don't have no choice. God is love. I said, wow, gave me the choice over whether or not I'm going to return his love. So the seeking, the seeking. It's all the, the, the seek. Don't be tripping. You know, you, you'll get intimidated if you come out here over a weekend and you hear the presenters. You know, you hear somebody waxing like Bob there. Don't trip off that. 
Now I'm going to talk like Bob Darrell. You'll hear Tom Ivers throw up here with 50-something years. Don't, you ain't going to get 50-something years tomorrow. You, that ain't going to happen. You know, you're going to hear Mari come up here and be this, I mean, Mari's going to have, draw from sources. You'll be like, oh, Mari G, I want to be like that. You know, don't trip off that. You know, don't, 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 don't trip off that. That's, that's, that's not the deal. You know, that's not the deal. You know, God don't make too hard terms with those who seek him. He don't make hard terms. Ralph's standing up here talking, and you might be, oh, I didn't read the book alone. God don't make hard terms with those who seek him. The power will improve your understanding of the power. Be a seeker. Don't be a fight. Be a seeker. Be a seeker. The power will improve your understanding of the power. You ain't got to have me come up here and tell you what it's supposed to look like. One of the things I like the most about this deal, this whole second step deal that I've embarked on alone, what ain't spiritual? You know, I needed a concept of a power to work for a guy like me. Most of us, and the reason I need a concept of that power is because I don't know what it looked like. Nobody comes into the world with a concept of a power. Most of us have it. We think we do, but we grow up in a family, and that family tells us what the deity is or what the religion is that we take. And if we don't have a family, it's from our neighborhood or it's from our community. And some of us might go out seeking on our own to expand and broaden what this, we might get on this spiritual quest. But when we do it, whatever, whatever joint we enter into, they tell us what, what it looked like. They tell us this is what it looks like if you're going to be in our camp. This is what the power looks like. These are the characteristics. These are the rules and the regulations for being a member of this deal. You know, so this whole, this, this, this concept of a power, this, this, and, and for me, I'm constantly refining the concept. Because I want a power that's personal to Ralph. And not only do I want to, un- I'm, I'm not really trying to get an understanding of the power. If the power's small enough for me to understand, he ain't big enough for me to trust. I'm not trying to understand God, you know. What I'm trying to do is get in relationship with. I want relationship. That's why it says a God of your understanding. Not a God that you understand. Don't get that confused. Whatever your understanding is, that's enough. That's enough, you know. But I want relationship. I want walk, talk, relationship. So when I'm in the car, I, I, I be like, dude, I don't know. You know, you be talking about you don't give me more than I got. I think you got a little bit too much confidence in your boy right now because you putting too much on me. And I, I just be talking. Power made me, and I got a mind that's got a mind of its own. Sometimes it think what it thinks. And I say, okay, when it go left, I say, okay, you don't want to put it up in me. Uh, don't blame me. You know, I'm just, you put this thing up in me. But I'm talking and I'm seeking. And I don't know what ain't spiritual. I fall down. I'm messy. I do stuff. You know, and but two things that I think come from any experience that I have. I'm not a guy that spends a lot of time tripping off the mistakes I make up in here. Two things that happen, lessons and blessings. Lessons and blessings. Either a lesson or a blessing or sometime, most time, both. Lessons and blessings. Don't trip off falling down. I used to think the spiritual meant floaty, doing stuff right all the time, not making mistakes, not doing the same thing. I do, not, not only do I make mistakes, I make the same ones. <laughs> Probably the only one up in here this weekend. I don't tell you. I'm, 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 you know, I'm the messy guy. I need this power. And, you know, and sometimes I think that I'm just one of his special boys because he puts stuff on my plate. Sometime for me to come and tell you guys that there's a power that can do for you in spite, you know. And so I come out of that deal, and then I get convinced that my life run on my will can hardly be a success. How do I do that third step? Made the decision to turn my will, which is my thinking and my life, which is my actions, over to the care of this power that I've been trying to get to in the second step. Because I'm after a spiritual experience. Don't forget that. Whole rest of the journey. I'm after the spiritual experience. Twelve-step process is a process of ego diminishment. The whole twelve-step process is a process of ego reduction. The whole twelve-step process is a process of grow God, shrink Ralph. Grow God, shrink Ralph. When you talk about how do I grow, you know, there's a part in the book that talks about, you know, if I don't enlarge and perfect, enlarge, bigger, perfect, better, enlarge and perfect, bigger and better my spiritual life, how? Through self-sacrifice and working with others, I won't be able to survive the what? Certain 
trials and low spots. I'm after bigger and better in this spiritual thing that I, I discovered because anything that ain't growing is dying. So that second step experience that I step out on, okay, how do I put it into action? How do I come to believe? How do I make this thing work? Well, first thing I do, I make a decision that I'm going to turn my will and my life over to something other and bigger than me. Why would I do that? Look at your life. Being convinced that my life run on my will can hardly be a success. Well, let's look at the record when I first came in. No driver's license, no place to stay, no job, no relationship, wife left, don't know where his little girl was enrolled in school, didn't think I was employable. I'd say you were doing a pretty fair job of mismanaging. Yeah, I'm under new management. You know, and so I do that, that third step. You know, made a decision to turn my will and my life, my th- you know, my thoughts and my actions over to the care of this power. It was scary. Scary. Because I'm going to turn my will and my life over to something. What if they, this power want me to be something I don't want to be? Make me a Jehovah Witness going door to door to you guys' house. What? Put me in a white polyester suit on a street corner preaching. I got a friend that used to say, that'll be better than what you was doing. Why are you tripping? You know, and I I need visuals sometimes, you know, and when I think about this power and and my relationship with it, because I like to grow my relationship with God. So when I say something like that, oh, man, you know, and and when I say something like that, what would God, it it lets me know what I think about the power. Why do I think God wants worse for me than I want for me? What does that tell me about my concept of the power? Well, I don't believe that God wants worse for me. I believe God wants better for me. How many parents we got up in here? We got a lot of parents in here. If you're a good parent, you don't want the same thing for your kids. You know, you got one kid that's a computer nerd. You got one kid that's an athlete. And you might be fathers and, God damn, get off that computer. I want you to go play football. And your kid is scared. No, that ain't being a good parent. A good parent wants Bobby to play football if you want to play football. He wants Joey to be a computer nerd if you want. What makes me think God is any different? What makes me think God is going to turn me into Bob? He's going to make me the best Ralph I can be. He's going to make me the best Ralph I can be. Not going to make me something other than me. Well, it's better for me than I want for myself. Does better for me than I can do for myself. When I do that third step prayer, God, I offer myself. It's so powerful. Sometimes it still blows me away today. Third step prayer. I offer myself to you. I'm, I, I know I'm getting ready. I offer myself to you. Build and do with me as it will. First time I took the third step prayer, I was a year sober. I was a year sober. And it blew me away when I thought about it. If I walk up to Sonia, the year sober Sonia, I offer myself to you to build with me. Dude, keep it moving. What? You know, I wasn't a vision for you. I didn't have nothing. But God don't do that. The, the, the thing about the third step prayer, anybody up in here, God don't do that. You ain't got to get right. You ain't got to be right to get right. I offer myself to you, still lying. Take me. I offer myself to you, still holding. Take me. I offer myself to you, still in bed. Okay, take me. I offer myself to you, I ain't through right in each other. I ain't through lying. I ain't through doing all the things. I ain't through looking at the, at the porn. I ain't through it. But I offer myself to you to do something with me, just like I am. I ain't got to clean up to come there. I ain't got to do. I offer myself to you, do something with me. And I'm going to tell you something over the course of these past 26 years. He's done something with me. He's done something with me. He's done something with me. And I got to remember that sometimes. And I'm still a work in progress. He's still doing something with me. I still stand on that. I still rest on that. My life, not only my recovery, my life rests on that. You know, this whole turning it over deal. You know, and if you're sitting in here right now and you wanted these people to talk about, Ralph, I keep turning it over, but I take it back. I keep turning it over, but I take it back. What's that about? Well, Mari G's going to tell you what that's about. My name is Ralph White, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs>